Hi, I'm Rebecca Rison here with Jeremy Roberts and welcome again to the Chit Chat. Hope you guys are doing well. Today we have a very special guest named Ellen Brewer. Ellen Brewer has always known she wanted to be an educator. Her mother who taught for 41 years was a wonderful role model to her. After completing her undergraduate degree at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee, she began her teaching career in Hines County then moving on to Clinton Public Schools. Ellen taught 11th grade United States history for 16 years while remaining active with Mississippi College and the School of Education there. She often was the guest speaker for educational methods courses, as well as traveling to various teacher conferences to share her Brewers Boot Camp State Test Review. Ellen completed her master's degree in secondary education and social sciences at Mississippi College in 2010. In 2015, she began teaching at the University of Mississippi. Here, Ellen teaches freshman EDHE courses in the fall while focusing on transfer EDHE courses in the spring. Ellen also teaches various educational methods courses and has supervised secondary social studies student teachers. She is currently working toward her PhD. Welcome to the show, Ellen. Good to see Hi, you. Guys. Hi. Hey. Thank you so much for joining us. We are excited to talk to you about your career path as well as your enthusiasm for teaching. So let's just start off with, you know talking about the basics. You've taught a lot of classes and for various populations over the years. How important is that relationship between student and teacher? Well, I, one thing I talk to my students all the time about is how valuable that relationship is. Um, I, you know, we know having a close relationship with your teacher professor prevents um, absenteeism. Um, it, you know, it promotes kind of a a positive role model. Um, and so for professors, I know from that viewpoint, it's really important that we kind of nurture that relationship. But for my students, you know, I, I talk to them about how valuable professors are, not necessarily that semester that you're, you're in their class. And professors can provide resources, you know, recommendations far into the future. Um, and and especially for those students who are away from home, it's another, you know, hopefully an, an adult that they can speak with for encouragement, advice, um, you, you know, help when they, when they need a little boost, a safe place when they're fearful. Um, but there's nothing, I don't think, that, that can negatively come out of, you know, having a relationship with a professor, a, a good positive relationship with a professor. And there are lots of things the students can do to, you know, manifest that. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of your recommendations for how students can build those effective relationships between themselves and their professors? Um, communication skills, I'm sure that's, you know, a huge element there, but I'd love to hear more about your recommendations. Yeah, um, we talk a lot, um, especially uh, in my freshman courses about how to properly write an email. So communication certainly is key. Um, I think um, other than that, you know, showing up for class, um, participating, even if you're not necessarily speaking. I talk with some of my students about how when I say I want you to participate, it doesn't mean you're answering every question. It means if I look at you, you're nodding or you're grimacing if I've said something that you don't um, understand or uh, agree with. But those are things that students can do. So the professor knows they're here, they're serious, they're invested. Um, I've told my own children, um, one of which is a freshman there this year, to just introduce yourself at the beginning of the semester. And I know for freshmen, that's kind of scary because they've never been in this college class before. And, you know, but um, if that is not something that they feel comfortable with, shooting the professor an email before class starts. Um, you know, this is my name and I'm excited about being in your class. Um, something else that I really encourage my students to do is, um, pick something in class that intrigued them or maybe confused them and send an email to the professor and just say, you know, I really enjoyed this topic today. I look forward to researching it a little bit deeper on my own. Um, or obviously in all cases, if a student needs help to reach out, if they're 
if they're confused about something. But I feel like the, I believe the more students can just interact and communicate and just kind of sop up, um, the, you know, the, the environment or the aura around a professor, I guess, the better um, that relationship will be. So you've taught students at the high school <laughs> level. You also taught students at the college level. You have one of your own in high school, one of your own in college. What we do working with students that you've seen, how to become successful. What are some things that you would consider non-negotiables for a student to become successful at the college level? Uh, I, I love that uh, question. I love that word non-negotiable. It doesn't really leave you a lot of wiggle room on getting out of something. Um, first thing I think um, that is super important for students at any level, but especially at the college level, university level, is to know the expectations. Um, I know, you know, oftentimes in high school, the school kind of sets the expectations. It's the same for every teacher. What I found with my freshmen especially and transfers who are new, um, they don't understand that every professor has different, you know, different expectations. There are, there's different grading scales. Some use plus, some use minus, some A is a 93 to 100, some A's are 90 to 100. And so I think going over the, the syllabi is super important. So the students just know from the onset, these, these are the expectations. Because mm -hmm. um, if you don't know those, it's really easy to mess up. Um, and it's really easy to find out those too late. Um, class attendance, of course, all those things that are mentioned in the A game um, are, are, you know, are really important. Sitting up front, participating. Um, the first day, um, every fall, I have my freshmen ask me a question. And one that I noticed that came up very often this year was, what's your best advice for a freshman here? And hands down, every time I answered, you have to learn how to say no. You have to say no to things um, that you know aren't academically motivated. I'm also the teacher that understands that social interaction um, is very much a part of university life, and I think it's very valuable. Um, so to balance those is really important, especially if you're new to a city. Um, you know, it sometimes I think. These students just feel like, you know, I've got to do this tonight. I will never see this band again. You know, I remind mine, the lyric's going to be here next month. You know, I mean, they'll come back around. So I think the ability to say no is really important. Um, and again, those things in the A game, you know, learning the material at a deeper level than what was expected in high school um, and, and be teachable. Um, you know, identifying your values, I think is important. Some are here because their mom just said, you're gonna to go to college. If you aren't identifying that this is something valuable to you, you're not gonna be very successful. Mm -hmm. And all of those are important for college success, which leads us to talk about <laughs> natural talent and intellect versus grit and resilience. What are your views on those two differences for success? Uh, I, I, I'm very interested in this and I, I plan to do a lot more research. Angela Duckworth, I don't know if y'all know her, but she's kind of an expert on grit. She has so many TED Talks. I, maybe I, I probably was introduced to her from something that y'all said along the way. Um, but she's done all this research uh, on grit, like uh, from West Point Academy to a new teacher in a classroom to kids at a spelling bee. And she's gone in and just tried to figure out who's going to be successful and why. And I can't remember the exact percentages, but I know she talks about how um, natural talent or, you know, and or intelligence it makes up, I think, about a third of what it takes to be successful. And the other two thirds is grit and resilience, which is great for those of us who don't, who aren't in the top 1% of IQs. We have hope. Um, 
but you know the ability to can to get up you know when you're down um, I show a lot of my students you know motivational inspirational little um, videos and the ability to to see long term um, that's all that's a maturity issue too um, and I, I would argue that it's pretty hard to have grit if you can't see long term so that's one thing I think that we we do all we all have to work on um but I, I think I think it was Michael Jordan NBA player he said one time um I may not be the most talented which is kind of hard for him to argue but <laughs> he is but he said um I won't ever leave the gym before somebody else. And so, you know, he knew that eventually there might be somebody more talented than him, um, but he was always going to work harder. Uh, and so, you know, people who have grit don't really, they get, they're able to understand that a failure isn't permanent. And I, I, that's, a, that's a big part of just being a, big boy and a big girl, you know, is that this particular moment is not forever. And so grit's going to help you through that. Your IQ, you know, your IQ points aren't. Well, and thinking about just the complexity of college, you know, and coming in at age 18, which is a critical <laughs> age, it's not like all students come in at age 18. There's a lot of students that come in and, you know, older than that, sometimes sure. younger than that too. But thinking about such formative years, you know, being in college and having to make complex decisions, um, how do these decisions at 18 or 19 or whatever impact their lives later on? What are your thoughts about decision making at this age? Yeah, the, the longer I've been here, um, it's only been six years here at Ole Miss, but and I maybe suppose I, I guess maybe because my children are getting a little older, I'm thinking about this. Um, but it's really scary, and I'm really trying to kind of incorporate some of these lessons in along with, you know, what we what we want to cover in the textbook for class A or class B. But, you know, we know our brains aren't fully developed till about 25 years old. Uh, and then, you know, we send these kids out <laughs> and say, you know, we want you to live in a room the size of a closet with somebody you don't know, and we want you to be 700 miles away from home, or we want you to join the military and have a gun. Um, and so, you know, because we changed the, the laws of the draft back in Vietnam, 18 is the magic age for some reason. Uh, you know, you're an adult now, and that's very scary. That that frontal cortex brain, I don't know all the scientific terms, but that's the part that is not developed until like the last, the late, the latest. And that's our part that teaches us or allows us to know right from wrong. And so we're pushing these 18, 17 year olds, in some cases, 17 and 18 year olds into this situation and environment where they have all these opportunities and there's not that kind of barrier. Um, and so we talk in my class about, you know, that one drink too many, driving home, hitting somebody, you know, that now has changed the entire trajectory of your life. Um, we talk about finances, you know, mistakes you make now can affect you buying your first home in four years. Um, and there are a lot of positive, positive things too, um, as far as decision making that come out of this time, for sure. But um, you know, I, I tell my students all the time to practice the pause, and that can go into all different areas of your life. One of which is when you're feeling like things are out of control, or maybe you are out of control. You've got to practice the pause and not make a decision. Um, write that second, you know, don't write back an email when you're upset. All these things have lasting effects. And, um, you know, if that part of the brain isn't developed, I can't go in and make it develop more quickly, but we can at least, you know, talk and verbalize and have them hear us say, they're going to be long-term effects on this is decisions that you're making now. Mm -hmm. 
sure. Um, and, and labels, tell us about labels, because I know you'd mentioned earlier uh, in the previous discussion we had about the importance of labels. So we'd love to kind of hear more about that too. Yeah, um, Les Brown is, um, he's a radio, D well, he started out as a radio DJ. He's a motivational speaker now. He's getting on up there in age, but um, I've become a huge fan of his. And um, he talks about how when he was in kindergarten, his teachers gave him this label um, and it's a very dated term, so I won't say it, but um, essentially that he was not smart and he was never gonna be successful in school. And it wasn't until they got to high school till a teacher stopped him and spoke with him and said, you know, you're not that name, you're not that label, you're not in that box. And he had spent all that time thinking that he couldn't because somebody had labeled him. And we were talking about this just the other day in my classes. You know, there, there are some positive labels too, which sometimes I think can ultimately end up having a negative effect. I mean, I had one of my students tell me that, you know, she grew up in this family. She had both parents, you know, a couple of sisters and brothers, a dog, big fancy house, all the money in the world, brand new car at 16. And so, you know, she was kind of labeled the rich kid. And a lot of people would say, oh, I would love that, you know, but that caused her some problems. And so I think if we understand um, the issues that other people might have had with labels. And I show my students a Les Brown video where he talks about that, what that teacher said to him and how it made him feel. I, I think more importantly, the lesson we can learn is not to do that to other people. Um, you know, not to label because they look like this or this and not to, not to be so hard on ourselves. You know, if we don't do so well on a test, it doesn't mean we're a terrible college student, you know, could mean a lot of things. Could mean you didn't prepare and you, you can reflect and, and prepare better next time. But, you know, we have to give ourselves some grace on these labels there. I think they're real, uh, labels are scarier than monsters to me. Um, you know, and, and a lot of us do it to ourselves more than anybody. So uh, I encourage my students to kind of stay away from, you know, categorizing people and even themselves. So we have some lightning round questions for you. This is how we like to end our show, getting to know you a little bit better. So the okay, first one is, no, don't be scared. It's good. It's all good. <laughs> the first one is you've talked about some motivational and inspirational things that you show your students. What are some quotes that you live by? Uh, one is um, a Martin Luther King Jr. quote, I'll have to paraphrase, but it is, he essentially said, if you're a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper you can be. And I, I give that to my students, we discuss it, you know, whatever you do, you got to do 100%. Um, you know, no matter if you think it's not important, um, you, you have to do everything at 100%. Another one that my dad taught me, and I have failed him often, and I don't know that it has much to do with education, but he always told me to be the best dressed person in the room. Um, you know, there's, there no, there's not ever going to be any kind of negative backlash if you're the best dressed in the room. Um, I, I wrote down a few others. Oh, another one of my favorite is your mood shouldn't dictate your manners. Okay. Um, and this guy, I, th I think he's pretty prevalent on Twitter. Um, I don't follow him much, but um, he shot something out a couple, couple months ago that I really like. He said, difference of opinion don't have to be threats. Intellectual friction isn't a relationship bug. It's a feature of education. And I think that's really kind of cool way to think of disagreeing with somebody. I did a whole lesson Tuesday in my class about how to have a conversation with somebody that you disagree with. And because we know these four years um, for these students, they're going to be, uh, you know, introduced to so many people who are different than they are. I think it's important for us to know and step back and, you know, not everything's a threat um, just because somebody's, somebody's different. 
Well, speaking of college, one of our favorite questions we like to ask, especially to get to know you whenever you were in college a little better, tell us about your freshman year of college. What was Ellen like as a freshman? Well, uh, I went to school in Nashville. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a football team. So, uh, you know, there wasn't that excitement. The big thing at Belmont was soccer. So I wasn't a soccer follower. As a student, I will say I needed some help. I needed some of these EDHE classes. Mm -hmm. um, I was a, a history major, which required an exorbitant amount of reading. Um, and I have pretty awful reading comprehension abilities, um, which of course is something that I've tried to work on since. But at the time, I, mean, I graduated high school when I was 17. You know, I just thought, well, I just can't understand that. You know, if, if I couldn't tell you what I read, it, I didn't dawn on me that it was something that I needed to practice on. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, I didn't go to class 100% prepared every time. Um, which then, of course, made me shy about speaking up in class. I was afraid I'd say something and the professor would be obvious that I didn't read. Um, I, I am good with deadlines. Uh, so, you know, I never had any issues with turning anything late or missing work. Um, but, you know, I would love to tell y'all that I was just, you know, the greatest model of a <laughs> student, my fr you know, a freshman. But, I wasn't, I, I got to see uh, my freshman year, my first semester and the scholarship that I had um, did not allow for that. I lost that scholarship. And my father called me and said, you can come home and go to the community college for free because of my high school stuff. But he said, I'm not paying for you to go up to Nashville and get C's. And my school didn't have probation like Ole Miss does and all that. I mean, I lost the scholarship at Christmas. It was gone. I didn't have another chance. So I, I had to get, I had to have a come to Jesus meeting with Ellen and, you know, start telling her, this is what I have to do. So mm -hmm. hope that's fun. not disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ellen obviously learned because look at where she is now. Oh, I hope so. Oh. We've got some more to go, though. Because <laughs> one thing um, the audience may or may not know, you know, a few years ago or a few semesters ago, you actually did win the Instructor of the Year for EDHE 303. Yeah. I mean, that's something that's voted on by the students in our courses. And that's something that our students found something or saw something or knew something in you to nominate you for that. And then our nominating committee read the information and thought that it was correct. So Ellen back then learned something and Ellen- I, I, I didn't fool anybody this time, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So it all works out. It all works I, I out. I guess. I yeah. guess. It only took 20 something years. <laughs> I tell my students and my two boys all the time, if y'all could just learn some of the stuff that I didn't learn till like my 30s, y'all could go ahead and start working on that now. Right. Uh, you will be happier much earlier in your life. So yeah, and that's something that all of our students, all of the people who are watching this need to know. So thank you for sharing that with them and you know, we do work with students who after their first semester, they're not happy with what they're doing. That's why we are here to help them. So I know whenever I was in school, we didn't have a lot of the same programs that you were just talking about, and now we do. So one of the biggest plugs that we make is reach out to us. Mm -hmm. Let's just have a conversation. Let's just talk about what's going on. So you don't have that parent phone call during Christmas break or when you go home for Christmas yeah. break for six weeks. Yeah, you're trapped. Exactly. <laughs> so we, we want students to reach out to us. And I know that you're there for your students and all the EDHE courses that you teach. So we appreciate you and all that you do for them. Um, we love working with you. 
with well, just I learning so. that the students have an advocate in you for them for whatever they need. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, I, I definitely, I tell mine, I, I'm their champion. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't work for you if I don't know what's going on. So right. that's exactly how I feel. Yeah. Well, Ellen, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on this episode of the Chit Chat. Um, viewers, we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and everything else you can think of. Come see us in the Johnson Commons East. We'd love to give you a tour if you haven't been over here yet. And we'd also love to help our students with whatever they need academically. So just let us know. But for Rebecca Rison, I'm Jeremy Roberts. We want to thank you for another great episode of the Chit Chat. We'll see you soon. Bye, y'all. Bye, thanks.